My guest today is Scott Masson, Professor of English Literature and a Public Intellectual at Tyndale University. We had a super interesting conversation. We talked cultural Marxism, its history, the importance of education, Scott's theory of heroes after the Enlightenment period. You can find many of Scott's lectures on YouTube under Scott Masson. That's Masson with two S's. I was so excited about this conversation that I jumped into it extremely quickly. There was no real easing into the, uh, into the conversation, and I think that I caught uh, Scott off guard for the first 10 seconds. But after that, I learned so much. So I hope that you learn from this conversation as much as I did, and I hope you enjoy it. So buckle up. Please welcome my friend, Scott Massett, to the Kazingram Dialogue. Hey Scott, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. How are you, Vin? Yeah, really good, thanks. Yeah, well, we're uh, looking forward to reading week, a little vacation, but uh, we had a little enforced one with the snowstorm today. So, yeah, it's true. The, the snow is getting kind of crazy here. They they have a um, snow day for most of the businesses here in Ottawa as well. Yeah, so, usual there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's we didn't lots. call we didn't call in the army here this time. So, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so Canada uh, is it something that I've I've always wanted to ask you so Canada Canadians are known for tolerance and inclus- inclusive inclusivity I guess and I've wondered is that something that happened in like because of Pierre Trudeau or was that was, was it that something else happened before that like what what brought it about the Canadians are value um, tolerance and inclusivity as, as, as a sort of virtue. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, as to my knowledge, it's pretty, it's pretty new in that sense, although new that's 50 years. Right. So, yeah. um, but as far as I know, that wasn't something that you would have associated with Canadians before and not that they weren't tolerant or inclusive, but I just don't think that that, that sort of a vocabulary would be used polite for sure mm-hmm. uh, respectful um particularly respectful of those in in authority um i mean canadian uh what americans talk about life liberty and the pursuit of happiness i think mm-hmm. canada's motto is peace order and good government which is like very different right and, and not very quite frankly very um doesn't get your pulse racing peace order and good government, <laughs> right but uh it, it suggests a quietness, uh, you know, but uh, not necessarily tolerance or inclusion. Those are, mm. those are later words, and um, and um, and I think they take on a very different tone in contemporary discourse than they used to, because tolerance has been a English political virtue as far mm. back as as John Locke. Oh, really? So, oh, yeah. like, what, what what was it? Like, what what did, what did Locke say about it? Well, yeah, he wrote something called an, it was an edict on toleration. It's basically um, uh, an allowance for uh, Catholic. Uh, I mean, Locke's writing in the Puritan era of the late uh, 17th century, and and uh, he he's talking about toleration of of uh, people who have. I mean, this is after the wars of religion when mm. uh, countries are not tolerating. Uh, religious opposition. So if you were in, in England, if you were uh, a Catholic or even a nonconformist, which is everyone other than an Anglican, you weren't allowed to be in the universities. Really? Uh, you weren't allowed political um, positions or promotions or so forth. So very much so. And um, and that would have been the same in Catholic countries and so forth. So I, I, toleration was just an allowance for to disagree on matters of fundamental uh, beliefs, but still be able to, in some way, um, operate in a in a body politic. So that's how tolerance began, and it was the right to it basically is the freedom to disagree. Right. And is it, it, did that come out of uh, the Enlightenment period, or was it was toler- tolerance always before, in existence before that? But I mean, uh, Voltaire picks it up again and talks about being, you know, um, being willing to die for those that disagree the right of those that disagree with him to speak and so forth. So it becomes a hallmark of the Enlightenment. 
um, after that as well, they pick it up. But it really, it's an English uh, civil virtue. And it's and but but now in our culture, it's tolerance is to be tolerant is to be intolerant of certain certain viewpoints, right? Yeah, I mean, I've written on this. Uh, the the sort of tipping point is in uh, if you want to. I mean, it's it's hard to connect and see how important this is. But a, an author who isn't much known these days, named Herbert Marcuse, wrote uh, uh, an essay called "Repressive Tolerance" in the 1965, I believe it was. Okay. And um, he argued that the English. Uh, tradition because it passed from Britain to Canada to the US of tolerating those that disagree with us uh, as a basically the hallmark of their civic virtue he said that this tolerance was not um, wasn't very tolerant because it it uh, it assumed certain common ground uh, amongst all of the people uh, who were being tolerated and uh, for Marcuse who was a you know, Marxist sympathizer, and this yeah. is remember this is the context of the sexual revolution, right? And, uh, student riots and in, in the U.S. and so forth. Uh, you know that ferment of the the 1960s. Um, he said he argued that uh, this notion of tolerance should not be tolerated because it because it repressed certain conversation points were just not conversation points, and he said that needed to be. And he so he spoke of it as a repressive tolerance. Okay. The old Lockean tolerance, which means would mean tolerating people that you've basically fundamentally disagreed with mm -hmm. and allowing them to speak because right. you believe the virtue of, of uh, civility and truth and discourse and dialogue, uh, that wasn't sufficient for the radical upheaval that Marcuse wanted. So he called that repressive tolerance and he advocated liberating tolerance, okay. <clears throat> which, would, which would basically implode that uh, status quo and i think that is the tolerance that we now know which is not very tolerant of, of dissent right and is that is is that the so in you know universities in north america in general there's this you know you if you're on the political right or you say anything that is against the prevailing view you're you know you're labeled a fast fascist or you're a bigot is is this idea of tolerance this um what's the word you use with uh this this gentleman well he so he called the Lockean tolerance he called that he labeled it repressive tolerance. repressive and the new tolerance he called liberating tolerance and the liberating to tolerance is pretty much not tolerating certain viewpoints yeah so it's the it's it's almost it's the opposite of what it's advertised right <laughs> yeah, but right. you don't you don't advertise your own positions in negative words right that's that's your opponents repressive and you're liberating right but uh it effectively means no um you know freeing the uh society from its basic core values and not, you know civil liberties allowance for disagreement in public because it doesn't open up the basic uh social institutions that marcusa thinks are are restraining uh, true tolerance, which includes um, sexual um, expression and um, okay, matters, yeah. Was he was he an American? Or was he no, like an immigrant? No, he's, uh, he, he's one of the um, the uh, Frankfurt School. Oh, the uh, Frankfurt School. That, that's yeah. like where the, that's where cultural Marxism. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's, that's right. That's the school associated with it, Theodore Adorno and Horkheimer and so forth. Right. And Mar Marcuse is one of the today lesser known of them, mm -hmm. but in the in the sixties the radicals uh, were marching, saying um, I think it was Marx Mao Marcuse okay. was the was the chant, and it was on banners uh, in dorm rooms in in Paris and in Berkeley and so forth. Marx Mao Marcuse. Okay. Get that, but it, so he was associated with obvious communists, right? Right. You were you were in Germany, right? Before for a few years. I lived there for three years. Yeah, lived there for three years. So was that before the Berlin Wall? Oh, it was after it came. It was out. after. Okay. So what was it like after the Berlin Wall? Was it the the, um, the Frankfurt School? Were they still? Were they? they were new, very, no, they were very popular. Yeah. Okay. To be honest, um, I I had never heard of the Frankfurt School when I when I moved there, I didn't study philosophy as an undergrad, I did English and history. Um, 
And uh, so it was new to me and I learned something about it when I was there. I mean, it was strongly, um, um, I met, I mean, I met some people that were very keen on the Frankfurt School and talking to me about it and so forth. But I didn't really explore it at the time. I just noted a lot of names on shelves in okay. the university bookstore that I afterwards that I didn't recognize, but I rec afterwards recognized these were all cultural Marxists. This is the right. university, all of them. So, for for our listeners that may not know, can you give us a bit a brief history of uh, how the Frankfurt School started? Uh, it- sure. So, so most people know that Marxism is a a political philosophy associated with uh, a certain view of uh, of economics uh, that uh, basically Marx is a is a materialist. Uh, he wrote his uh, his doctoral thesis on um, Democritus, the ancient uh, Greek philosopher who thought that um, that. Uh, that reality consisted of atoms. So he's an early atomist. So mm-hmm. fl- reality consists of material, um, which is interesting. It's in terms of his intellectual development. And, um, but m- the Marxists thought that there would be, they noted there were regular political revolutions in, in uh, Europe and, uh, and thought that the next great revolution that came along would bring about the Marxist ideal, which was the workers basically overthrowing the bourgeoisie and the political establishment and seizing the means of production so that there would be a sort of, in the name of liberty, fraternity, uh, equality, the French revolutionary aims, that that would happen through that. And then the First World War happened and the Marxists thought, okay, well now it's coming. And nothing happened. And no, it didn't happen. They found that uh, that by and large the working class people stayed loyal to their own country and furthermore to their to the aristocracy and, mm. and you know their own countrymen in fact they were remarkably loyal and this shocked the marxists because they thought here's the ideal opportunity and uh, out of that other, other than in in uh, russia where Mar- marx thought it would be in the most advanced countries like like Britain, Britain. okay Robert Sure. Um, and instead it happened in Russia, which was the most backward country in Europe. And, um, and then it happened also in China, which is at that mm. time backwards and so forth. In fact, that's become, that was a cons- consistent pattern there. Um, but that failure of it uh, led a lot of soul searching amongst the Marxists. And, and they realized and they came to the conclusion that the biggest problem for the working class is they were invested in their culture, their families, their, their, their religion. It mattered to the working people. Their Christian, their Christian faith mattered to them. So their families mattered to them. They weren't willing to basically destroy everything in order to bring about this revolution. And so the revolutionaries realized that they had to, you know, uh, break into the social assumptions of uh, the working class in order to bring about the revolution. So it was going to have to be, rather than violent, it would have to be a long, slow march through the institutions. So it would be like a dedicated war against uprooting Christian values. Yeah, just... it was interesting. Yes, it was. Yeah. And the family and family sexual norms and so forth. And Mark and Marcuse is part of that. He's not the he's not the first, but he is the one that we connect with tolerance. That was his um idea. And so so this the sexual revolution we could say was the direct result of cultural Marxism trying to well it's certainly the intellectual uh basis for it okay Um, the the idea of uh associating the conservatives with fascism uh the the sort of f scale of uh, that goes back to uh adorno and and associates it again with with patriarchy and and uh, you know basically family norms those Mm -hmm. would be associated with fascism by by adorno um and so he, you know, he, he's the one who is associated with the, this idea of fascism with conservative values, okay. which, which is actually rather odd. If you look at the Nazis, they weren't particularly conservative. Right. Uh, in fact, they were environmentalists, which I never see, never ceases to surprise people uh, that uh, that was part of the movement. But sexually, they were very, it, it wasn't the case that they were monogamous and they certainly weren't Christian in their convictions. Mm. They persecuted the church. 
although they also co-opted the church as as many know but um, anyway wasn't culture seen as like part of the bourgeoisie bourgeoisie yes so yes. what happened then because so the marxists had no interest in culture at all the original marxists they thought that culture was a bourgeois thing right and it was no interest to them whatsoever and then they realized again uh, when the first world war uh, with all with all of the upheaval that that brought about and yet still didn't bring about a revolution They realized that culture was way more important than they had thought. In fact, it was the key So they had to overturn the culture if they wanted to overturn the political order okay. And that I don't think evangelicals realized either until relatively recently suddenly people because you see a lot of you know the so-called culture wars It's still politics, right? People are politics you know we need to get this you know this guy elected and then they'll be changed and they no, that's not how it works um, you need to uh, change hearts and minds the culture is is an, an important part I'm not talking about just for establishing political gains I, yeah, I'm yeah. talking uh, in terms of working out your convictions the culture mm -hmm. is essential and um, and and the cultural Marxists learned that lesson and I don't think that Christians uh, to this day still think that culture is that important hmm. that's my experience how, how would you define cultural Marxism well it's it's trying to bring about the aims of Marxism the revolution that was spoken of um, by an alternative means through through the long slow march through the institutions. so I, I've used that phrase already but so it will work through um, the Hollywood the oh, Marxism okay. created the Hollywood establishment very early on really uh, Yep, uh, through the through the universities, through the legal framework, through all of the main uh, cultural um, like institutions. Institutions, yeah, institutionalizing it, doing it very slowly through the bureaucracy, bureaucracy, um, which is a way of doing it. You know, not only so it's, it's slow, but it's also once it's started, it's very hard to stop um, and and overturn, uh, and so. The current state that we're in is is one that's developed very slowly over the course of time. So you you were saying that um, evangelicals have been very slow to catch on this, um, I guess this revolution, this slow revolution that has happened. Is there a reason for? Is it because evangelicals have been too pragmatic or too focused in politics, on the or the just the economic side of Marxism and saying, okay, look, you know, Marxism failed. With the with the fall uh, with the uh, with the wall falling, so we don't really work. We don't need to worry about um, the culture because uh, cu cultural Marxism, because you know that's not the important thing. Is that would that be a fair or somewhat fair assumption? Well, Mark Knoll wrote a book years ago called "The Scandal of the Evangelical." Yes, Mind. yes. And the scandal was that there wasn't one, which is <laughs> which is fairly scandalous. Um, and I'm not sure he's, uh, I haven't seen recent stuff, but I, I thought I heard somebody say that he hasn't really changed his view on that. Okay. And, um, and I think the reason for that is that education is not taken seriously by evangelicals. Um, education in general, like parental education or education as in? Education in the sense that um, most evangelicals still send their kids to the public system. Mm, the public mm -hmm. Now, not only... Uh, it was never neutral towards them, but it's certainly not neutral any longer, and yet they still send their kids. Uh, and um, to me, that's not taking education seriously. It's not seeing how important a slow process of uh, in enculturation yeah. that takes place in schools and in a way that you can't really reverse by going to one service on a Sunday right. or, or a, an altar call or whatever you want to refer that event uh, that some churches do um, you know culture and religions are supposed to mark every aspect of your life uh, if you're devoting or sending your kids to a public system that is committed to um, attacking the Christian faith or at the very least ignoring it then how serious are you about your Christian convictions yeah I mean it, that's where what it comes down to so if you're serious about the evangelical mind, then you're you're really going to be involved in Christian education. Right. So what is it about um, evangelicals that they don't really see the connection between culture and their faith? So 
So, I mean, it seems historically that to be a Christian is more than just a set of beliefs, right? It seems like a whole, whole set of other things like culture, how you live your life, what you believe. It was all kind of a group of things. But now it seems to be a Christian is, oh, I believe in, say, Jesus died for my sins and he rose yeah. again. And that's about it. That's about all the Christianity North America knows. Yes, I agree. That's sort of revivalist Christianity. Um, that's the revivalist Christianity that would have been preached, uh, you know, a century and a half ago, in the context of the civil England or of the civil war in the U.S. Uh, to a culture which would have been bathed in uh, Christian teaching, and they could have made certain assumptions about that those people. But as the culture moved on, and particularly as that that movement accelerated in the 20th century, particularly after the Second World War, um, those same methods, that doesn't work anymore. They yeah. can't, they, so the culture changed and the church didn't change with it. It still, still used its methodology and it didn't adapt to what had, had become in a completely altered landscape. And, and Christianity is about uh, not just a you know, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a personal faith that obviously is uh, vital. Um, it's a total, there's a cosmology that goes with mm -hmm. it. Your politics effect, affects your, your family. It affects the way you look at work and not only the way you look at it, but the, um, what is done in work. It, it affects mm -hmm. the life of the mind. It believes that knowledge is something that you can actually, uh, God's un creation can be understood and it not only can it be understood, it should be understood. You ought to apply your mind uh, to it. Whereas most e evangelicals in my experience are, are pragmatic. And education is basically a means to get a degree, a piece of paper that will then let you get on with real life and real life is earning money. Right. This is the materialism that, <laughs> that Marx said was the ultimate reality. So how are evangelicals different than Marxists then? Mm -hmm. is, the, is the idea of, um, of sending your uh, kids to public education and not seeing a sort of um, contradiction, I guess would be the right word to use, is that a failure on the part of the um, the church leaders, the Christian thought leaders, or is that is that a failure on the part of just general Christians as a whole? Well, leaders are supposed to lead, right? So I guess it's hard to um, um, you know exonerate them from the charge of uh, some sort of responsibility. Um, I think seminaries uh, who yeah. train pastors have not a, have not changed and adapted to their changing reality. Um, many seminaries uh, do not promote Christian education, ironically, in the sense okay. you thought, you know, that's the one place where you're going to get it, but you don't, uh, often in my understanding. And... Um, and so again, there's there has not been an adaptation to the culture, or, or where it is there, it's you know they'll talk about postmodernism and so mm. forth. Is but, it? Yeah, I'm a liter I, uh, literary theory is one of my areas of yeah. expertise. Postmodernism has been dead in the academy for 20 years. 20 right. years, nobody talks about postmodernism. But in the church, to be up and trendy and really speaking to the culture, you got to be involved. You gotta understand postmodernism. I think, wow, <laughs> it's like you have to stay on top of this stuff. And it, it really, nobody's talking about postmodernism is you, here's your truth mm -hmm. and I've got my truth and we can, we have different, we can di agree to disagree, you know, and that, so we have different truths. Well, nobody says that anymore. That's because nobody, nobody buys postmodernism. So what's the, what's the popular, what's the prevailing view now then in literary cultural, theory? Cultural Marxism, uh, okay. intersectionality, which is a variation on it, I think. Right. Um, and, and I think a growing uh, area is, uh, is transhumanism, posthumanism, environmental, mm -hmm. those sorts of uh, things. But obviously the, the, the whole uh, sexualized identity politics is a, that's connect, all of those are connected. So is, okay, so you mentioned Christian uh, education. Is that, are, when you're saying Christian education, are you referring to like the, to the to the real liberal arts where it's like the trivium and the tri uh, and the quadrivium is that what you're referring to well that those are just the branches of learning the different okay. way and art is actually the latin word for a way okay. uh, 
So there are seven ways of learning and the, the trivium is related to uh, language or the word, so grammar and logic and rhetoric. And uh, the quadrivium would be connected to number. Okay. Uh, so there would be uh, arithmetic and geometry and astronomy and music. Mm -hmm. Music as a, as a, as a science, as it were, connected to art, but, but number and, and uh, word as a way of understanding the fundamental basis of reality, I think that remains the case, even though I would say certainly in the quadrivium, uh, modern science has changed uh, some of the basics there. Um, so, but, but still, I would say fundamentally, yes. So when you, when, when you educate, when you learn, you're learning truth. And, and truth that can be verified and, mm -hmm. and uh, will not adhere to, to uh, you know, will obey the basic laws of logic that Aristotle taught. Whereas modern education admits <laughs> uh, all sorts of things that uh, are impossible. And, and it sees education, the purpose of education is uh, to create activists, which right. is, you know, that's a form of pragmatism, I guess, but it's certainly not education. So do you have, are you hopeful about, uh, about the universities for the future? Like, I, I, do you think that the universities in general will, these large, huge universities that we have, do you think they'll fail as go we go down. on? They're all going down. You think so? Going down in, in like the, the 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 amount of people going to universities will shrink, and as a result, the universities will have to learn to use their resources properly. You know, perhaps not have like gender I studies. Don't know that, I don't know how it takes place, but when when uh, institutions of learning are no longer willing to reject um, or throw out academics that will um, admit that there, you can have contradictions mm. in, in, and that uh, they don't pursue truth or they think that truth is uh, antithetical to what they do. And it's really about uh, indoctrination and promoting activist learning and so forth. As soon as the universities admit this, they're no longer universities. Mm. If not universities, then there's the issue of what exactly are they doing? Right. And then there's the huge cost of it. And, um, you know, the, the, the debts of, uh, that Western governments bear, not just Western, but around, around the world. So, and the increasing cost plus the, la the diminishing returns that come from university education, I, I just think they are doomed to fail. I don't know when that's yeah. going to be happened. I think it is inevitable. And you're, uh, saying that, you're saying that as an academic yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I happen to think that, that Christians can do it otherwise and, mm. and some do do it otherwise, but they need to be very wary of following the pattern of, of uh, the, uh, the universities at large. I'll give you an interesting anecdote here. Yeah. There was a critic by the name of Harold Bloom in the 80s, who was uh, the sort of the most prominent, in the 90s for that matter, really the most prominent literary critic of his, of his day. Uh, Fame for his um, uh, work Shakespeare and the Invention of the Human, or um, Gosh, what was the other one? I can't remember. He wrote a wide variety of them. He's a romantic scholar at, uh, at his roots. But he was a secular Jew, uh, and he defended the great tradition. I think that was another one of his books. Okay. And, um, and at the time, he was attacked by the, the critics of his day, the post, um, post-modernists, the feminist critics, the post-colonialists. They all went after him, and he talked about them as schools of resentment. And uh, But he was getting you know, shouted at from, mm. he was a Yale professor uh, uh, for decades and decades. When he retired, as I say, he was a secular Jew. He gave his books, not to Yale. He gave them to a small Catholic liberal arts college because he said only uh, the small Christian liberal arts colleges are still doing the humanities. Only them. And I think that was the case for the time at for a time, and I think it can still remain the case. But that, but even Christian institutions are having the same problem of the trends in academia as a whole mm. starting to break into their institutions in the way that Jordan Peterson has brought to the public's attention. Are you finding that within uh, within the universities, the students themselves 
are more pragmatic. They don't really, they only view university as a means to an end rather than uh, as a place where they can dedicate four years to you know, learning or learning how to learn. Have you found that in with your with students that you've taught? Like, what's the what's the um, atmosphere like when you're teaching? These I'm, I'm assuming you you tell the students these things every now and then in your classes. Oh, every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I find that they're disoriented in general when they come in. So I find they're disoriented from life, um, from disoriented because of their lives. Mm. They, there's familial breakdown often. Um, there's a cultural uh, disintegration. There are signs of it all around us. Um, there's uh, um, scandals all around them. And pop culture, you know, the Me Too movement, church leaders. There's a real sense of um, almost, I don't know if the despair is set in. I don't find that in my own institution at Tyndale. I don't find that, that that's the case. They're, most of them are, are Christians professing. But I do think that they come in and they're, um, uh, I don't want to say apathetic, but they're not on fire to learn. That, mm. So uh, C.S. Lewis talked about this years ago. And he said the problem that he faces, and he said this in The Abolition of Man, was uh, that he didn't have to pull roots up or, or weeds out of them. It wasn't like they were, they'd gone to seed, they were rotten. It wasn't that, it was more like he had to irrigate deserts. And that would, I would agree with that. I would say that, that there's a lack of, um, they've never been exposed to the truth in mm. uh, a robust way. And I find that when you do that, uh, they respond. Um, it really do. And, and the light switches on. And I, I've seen it over and over. Mm. And I experienced it myself when I went to university that, that suddenly I was being challenged to think and, uh, and I mean, genuinely think, and thinking is not an easy thing. Mm. And you, you actually don't meet many people that, that think. And one of the reasons that Jordan Peterson is as popular as he is, is that guy mm. thinks, or he tries to think. Mm -hmm. it, when I say he tries, I don't mean that pejoratively. He, he, when you can hear him or I, and I watched a fair bit of him on YouTube now, and I, I hadn't done that for years, but I, I started to, and, and I noticed that when I, I, I met with him one time as well, privately, and, and he listened, he really listened. Like you can, you can tell when somebody's listening to you. Right. And I, I've seen that in conversations that he's had or, or when he lectures, somebody asks him a question and he, he sits there and you can tell how he's thinking. And he, and he genuinely say, not only what is the question, but what is, what is he really asking me? Mm -hmm. and, and when you do that with people, then there, that process of, the Socratic dialogue, the pulling out of the conversation, that because, and that's when people think that you're taking them seriously. And that's when they switch on and they, and they are getting fed as well. And that's so, and it's just, I find it, I find education intoxicating and, um, and, and seeing people grow and, and start to flourish. That, that's just the most exciting thing in the world. But it's, it, it's rare though for most, it, it, do you, would you say that's the case for most professors that that's that's the kind of attitude that they have i, I don't know um, is it, it, what what what, it, the, what is the attitude that most of them have well the reason i ask is uh i've i've met a lot of professors and and quite a lot of them will say things like you know it, not in not in public but privately they'll say oh you know i agree with jordan peterson but i'm not going to say it publicly it's like oh, okay it's like well if you you know if you really care about teaching or trying to get your students to learn you know you should be an example um, to say hey look I listen to this guy I agree with some of the things he says feel free to disagree with me and let's talk but it seems like most academics aren't aren't like you they won't they're not really in, it seems like, I, I could be completely wrong, but it, it seems like they're not in, they're in more so to save their jobs, if that's the way. Like, they don't want to say something in case, you know, they get fired or they get told off by the bureaucrats. So they'll kind of keep their mouth shut. And so in class, they're very PC. You know, they, they won't really ask the questions that they know that will get the students thinking. And is there, is there... I think that's terribly sad. And and uh, 
and they're modeling a certain type of behavior as well, right? Everything's a teaching moment, not just when you're talking, but the way you conduct yourself outside the classroom. Um, so for me, I lose all credibility if I don't have an integrity of how I act uh, um, in, in various places. Um, so if I think something's true and I'm not willing to say that it's true because of consequences, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a time when you need to be wise and you need to be careful about what you yeah. say and when you say it. I understand that. And that's not necessarily cowardice. That might actually be wisdom. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you never do that, and if they actually, as they say, agree with Jordan Peterson, I don't know on what subject you're talking about, but um, then you would have to say, well, what do you mean you agree with it? If you agree with it, then you'd be doing what he does. You, you right. have to, because you don't, you don't agree with it. What, what You lack the courage of your convictions. Mm. But if you actually were in agreement with him you wouldn't be quiet be quiet you couldn't do that because you yeah. don't you don't actually agree with him you you because it's because truth brings with it conviction yeah. and again it, it, so how can you expect i mean again the moral aspect of education is the essential part of it you can't actually be effective in the world if you have more, no moral integrity right the loses their moral integrity in any field of life they lose their effectiveness but teachers that won't stand for the things that they purport to believe in lose that very thing. So they can't be effective teachers anymore. Mm. They can't expect the, the, their, their students to be other than like them, which is formally adhering to the truth, but actually in practice being willing to turn a blind eye to right. things. I just don't think that that, I don't think that Jesus would be like that. Right. I, I just, there's just no way. So, so in our contemporary culture, there's the aspect of, um, I guess, the courage and when you think courageous, when courage is taught, it's more so like if you're an activist, right, that you're being courageous when you're outside holding, uh, you know, when you're protesting for, you know, I don't, I don't want to say like the animal rights or whatever. That's seen as, that's seen as virtuous. But the aspect of courage as in standing up for what you believe, when you do that, it seems like usually the ones who are standing up say on conscientious ground they're you know they're sh they're shut down or they're like looked down upon like there was the case of um this old um I, I believe he was a catholic priest here in ottawa and he was protesting he was a pro-life guy and he was protesting um he was just he just wore a shirt saying free speech is the is the fundamental value something like it's fundamental value for western tradition or something and he was within the 150 i say the uh, court violence or whatever. yeah and then he got arrested yeah. and it was like okay you know for wearing, that shirt. for wearing that shirt what does that shirt have to do with abortion because Did apparently placard as well or? no he didn't he didn't so oh. he had he previously he like he's, he'd been known to protest for yeah. protests or like was a pro-lifer but this time around he wasn't he wasn't even protesting for pro-life. He was just wearing a free speech shirt and he got arrested. And I, and I was thinking when I first read this, I was like, okay, what has our culture really come down to when this old man is being arrested for just wearing a shirt that's, you know, perhaps he's trying to imply that he should have the free speech to protest um, pro-choice. Maybe that's the implication that they drew and call the cops on. But that's fair enough. Again, but that's not protesting abortion. That's, that's stating that you believe that there's a freedom of speech. So they, they, I would have thought there would be a case for false arrest there and the charges would be that, but the point is that they would know that as well. And they were trying to make an example of him, but he would also know that they might have done that. And so mm. he was willing to put himself at risk in that sense. And I, I admire that. I have to say, um, mm. I don't know what the effect of that is, but yeah. I th it's, it's admirable that somebody is willing to take a risk to do that. And I think this is, again, it's not Jordan Peterson's 12 rules of life that are yeah. in people's lives. It's his convictions hmm. and care for people. And I mean, those are manifest things. I think people will find not everything that he says that they won't agree with all of it, but, but they do agree with a great deal of the substance, but most of all, they, they like his integrity. Mm. And the reason that that's refreshing is because they don't see it elsewhere. Right. Right. So the guy's, he's hugely popular mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it's phenomenal. 
and and Christians will watch more of him than they will of of uh, of, of Christian right. teaching. And again, the church needs to to uh, listen up on that and hmm. take lessons. Is it is the is it because Jordan Peterson not only is he standing up, but he, he's in he's okay. and he's yes, but he he's kind of giving people reason to do, I guess, to They're find meaning. Or? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, some of the, the stuff is, I think it's so basic that it, uh, it shouldn't need to be said, but clearly uh, I'm wrong. Right. Uh, what, what, what would an example be? Well, just, uh, you know, shoulder, I haven't read the 12 rules of life. So, um, but standing, you know, shoulders back, um, uh, make sure that you uh i i don't i don't know the 12 rules at all actually but in terms of his um unwillingness to be uh manipulated in situation he's going to make sure that he asserts what he has to say yeah and very clear respectfully with those that disagree with him why why he disagrees with them and and do so in a way and he doesn't back down and mm. you never see that in public life you right. never see and, uh, and they don't know what to do with them. The media does not know what to do with them. And they, they keep on using the same old stupid ploys of trying to shame him. And, and it's, it's, it's comical. Right. Because he knows, okay, so here's a fight and you're gonna, and you're gonna get him. And I'm just, I'm sort of laughing to myself. He's gonna flip you over and he's gonna kill you. And he does every time. And it is just literally, and people are, it's like blood sport. And, and people are, this is great because he's gonna bring, he's gonna take them down. And, uh, you know, I, I think part of him probably likes it. And part of him, I, I mean, I used to do culture wars type stuff mm -hmm. and would affect me for a while, quite a while afterwards, quite frankly. It's, it is, there is a sort of a combat going on there. Even if you're not viewing it that way, yeah. it, is, it, it is an attack. And, would you, um, yeah. Would you see it, would you see the amount of support that uh, Jordan Peterson is getting as uh, as indicative of an underlying or like an underbelly of people who are kind of sick of the PC culture. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, really, uh, okay. there's a long, there's a longing for something more meaningful and something uh, that is um, cuts through the BS mm -hmm. uh, and um, is willing to be candid and is willing to tell truths that are unpalatable that are mm. simply not permitted in the public square anymore and um, this is not as it was sold uh, to us 20 30 40 years ago or even 10 years ago um, what you know, do you same, mean? same sex marriage it was something that we were going to allow and it would be some would be allowed and it wouldn't change anything else and and, yeah. and simply not proved to be the case right you can't really disagree with it as being promoted in the educational system uh, if you don't agree with it or if you won't march you know in the pride parade then you're mm -hmm. you're an intolerant bigot etc etc so those sorts of things that's just an, an example because there are, you could name 50 examples but that those sorts of things lead people to think you know what there's there's a lack of integrity in uh, the activists, they're not really interested in a dialogue. They're not interested in having their truth and letting you have theirs. That was just a pretext to gain an advantage. And then once they have the advantage, mm. we're not, we're never letting you uh, back in a debate ever again. Right. Sort of like what happened in the, the Arab Spring, right? So there's all these supposed overturnings of dictators and then new dictators come in where right. even more oppressive than the last and there's no freedom at all. Um, and once once they get in, you're never going to get them out. Uh, so it's it's funny because that, and it goes it goes back to that 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 notion of tolerance. So the, the the notion of tolerance that Marcuse went after was meant to disrupt the common ground between opponents, hmm. because the the opponents on either side of the political aisle they were willing to be civil with one another. They'd go out for a drink after right. a debate. They, they could be very good friends and they would politically disagree on the means to a certain end, but they would still agree on the importance of the family, what a family was, what a human person was, on the, on the right to life, that life 
ought mm. to be held to be sacred from beginning to end, those sorts of things, that, that uh, national boundaries were important, that there's a sense of unity and all these things. Those things are now no longer common. So mm -hmm. the, common, the common good has been lost. And it, it, it hasn't been lost, it's been killed. It's been killed off by activists in, in academia primarily. The, so, so, okay, so going, you, your point about family, killing the family. I, I think I, I, was, I listened to one of your lectures. You have a YouTube channel, right? I do, I just started it, yeah. You just started it? Uh, I'm glad you started it. How's that yeah. been going? I'll, I'll, well, I'm just, throw, I'm, so I'm recording current lectures, just a few of them, and I'm trying to find old stuff that's out there and, yeah. and there. I, I basically, and I'll have my own website soon as well. I okay. wanted to sort of uh, get in touch with the 21st century and, and embrace <laughs> technology a bit um, because I did do a lot of TV debates and radio stuff mm -hmm. over the years and uh, it, I just wanted to house it under one site so that it was sort of like a virtual CV and people could be informed by it because again, it's part of my vocation as a Christian scholar to be a public intellectual. And this is mm -hmm. how I can do that. I can reach people that I've never met. Um, right. one, one guy came to Tyndale this year from Hong Kong uh, because he heard a podcast of me. Really? Yeah, yeah. I was That's shocked. Cool. Yeah, I, thought, I thought that was, this is great. And the poor guy didn't end up getting to take a class with me. But anyway, never mind. <laughs> Next <laughs> time. Uh... I'm really sorry for him. <laughs> Well, if he's listening to this, then he yeah. should try to take a uh, to take, try to take a class I'll with you. Go for a coffee or something. At least. Yeah. So okay. So with the family, um, I, I think I was listening to a lecture of yours, and in it you made this very interesting point that I I had never ever thought about. And you were saying that after I guess as a result of the Enlightenment, um, there was an emphasis and there was a there was an emphasis on orphans as heroes. Oh. Right? Am I, am I getting this right? And you, and you said this was this kind of uh, shift in emphasis on orphans as heroes because orphans are obviously kids with no parents was an indication of um, like a slow demise of the family. And I thought, well, this, I've never heard of this. And, and you mentioned a bunch of heroes, like you said, I think Superman is an orphan. A um, bunch of the, I'm trying to think of some of the Batman orphan and i thought I to I, write a book on this i i've i've been talking about this for years and i've never heard anybody else say it and i need to say it before somebody steals my thunder because this happens to me all the time but um and maybe this podcast is going to ruin it all because somebody <laughs> it. so they all miss the boat again but uh yeah i noticed this years ago <clears throat> and um so i'm very interested in heroism i yeah. i think literature it's it's an important feature of the um of two main literary forms. It's, it's a prominent feature of the epic and it's a prominent feature of the uh, tragedy. Both of them have heroes. And heroes tend to be, uh, classically speaking, they tend to be your social superiors and they tend to be morally admirable and they're better than you in some way. They're, Aristotle says that the tragic hero ought to be a king or somebody of superior rank and morally admirable, etc. He has to be better than us at any rate because otherwise that's how we notice the, the fall that he un, that he mm. undergoes mm. that he's he's above us <clears throat> and in the uh, in the classical epics again these are demigods like Aeneas and um, Odysseus and Achilles and so forth um, so those tend to be heroes and they and that will carry on through the heroic age and into knights and so these are morally morally admirable individuals or or the lives of saints they they're superior to us in some way but they, uh, they're men, they're grown men, and they're, they're better than us. But come the 18th century and the, the French Revolution and that period, you suddenly start noticing, and it gets more and more prominent to the point where it's now, it's deafening, hmm. that heroes are almost invariably orphans. And I, I noticed it, and I don't know when I noticed it, but I know it's been decades, but I noticed it, and, and then I kept th and thinking about it, and it started like, it's not just that it happens occasionally, it's almost always the case. Mm. So, you talk, so it begins with, it, it, with the romantics. Their heroes are often children and they're often orphans, which is itself revolutionary to place children as the, the main protagonists in a, 
fictional account is unusual or animals or so forth. You get, you get a bit of that historically, but not really that much, but children, but particularly orphans, the romantics talk about that. And then it becomes a feature of the fiction of the Brontes and it becomes the feature of Charles Dickens fiction. And it carries on through the 19th century and little orphan Annie. And then you get, um, um, Anne of Green Gables, yeah. <laughs> it, you'll get uh, the, you mentioned the Batman, the Spider-Man, but all the superheroes are orphans, actually. Yeah. James Bond is an orphan. Uh, Harry Potter's an or orphan. Um, even uh, in Frozen, the girls are orphans. That's right. right. Now, all the, the Disney characters are all orphans. It's, okay, so what Bambi's an orphan. Bambi's an orphan. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, the, 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 her, her, his dad's still around, actually. Oh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> But mom gets killed off. Yes. Yes. Sometimes the parents just aren't around, you know, even with animals. And sometimes they get killed off quite horribly as well. They begin there and then they're gone. But so I thought, well, what's what's with this? Because uh, this is not accidental. This mm. is a consistent feature. Orphans, historically, this is a pitiable state. In, in, uh, in the Bible, it talks about uh, the need to take care of widows and orphans because they are very needy and vulnerable, etc. And Christians set up orphanages to look after that, you know, kids who don't have anyone to look after them, no one to educate them. But now come the 18th century becomes the norm. Why? Uh, the answer is that they have no parents. And that is what a culture which wants to start from scratch wants to encourage. It wants to, it wants people to stop listening to tradition stop listening to parents stop listening to authorities hmm. and pursue the aims of the enlightenment which is to think for yourself right but the way you really do this is by no longer even connecting yourself to your family and, so, and, so, and a sort of like blank slate yeah the blank slate the the lockean blank slate uh, but now it's applied to the realm of a, a personal education and personal development and you then you lionize that and you present mm. it as a heroic task to endeavor and you're educating yourself and you're invariably in all of these heroes they are forced to look within themselves for whatever virtue it is that they will need to accomplish whatever goal is or whatever obstacles are in their path they need to circumvent them somehow and that's how they do that they look within themselves and i also noticed that 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 occurred at the very same time as the humanities were being transformed to, to what I call the human sciences, the, the Geisteswissenschaften is the German word. Okay. And, and so there are new disciplines that are, were emerging, anthropology, mm -hmm. psychology, sociology. Okay. Uh, these are all new disciplines in the humanities, didn't exist before. Religious studies rather than theology. Theology is banished from the university. Right. Early 19th century, now we have religious studies. Yeah. It's, very different thing um, and all of these have a similar presupposition that we are at the on the pinnacle of history looking backwards and trying to trace how we got from back there to where we are now and but we're looking at the past as something that we have got beyond and we're wanting to, prog to progress in our knowledge towards a distant future that has never been named but it's it's a sort of utopian ideal and that's the purpose of these new human sciences hmm. And um, and this is this is encouraged in the the children as well uh, through all of these popular stories, is to get them to think of themselves in in contradistinction to the inherited wisdom of the past, and I think it's 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 central to the project of disrupting um, the uh, the Christian consensus. And do you think this is um, is, is 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 effective? It has been. So the, the, so well, you're talking, well, you, well, why are Christians only talking about their personal relationship with Jesus and not talking right. about God? Well, that's why, because mm. that's left. They, 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 you can't see Christ worked out in the humanities. You can't see it worked out in the workspace. You can't see it worked out in culture. You can't see it worked out in history because you don't study history. You study, right. you do social studies. None of these disciplines are interested in, in the way truth has been worked out providentially throughout history or the development of doctrine. They're interested in the progress. And, and, uh, and then all that's left is your own personal psychological relationship with Jesus. That's the right. only thing left. Right. And that's not very helpful, quite frankly.
and th and this seems to um, uh, it seems like it leads to sort of trans transcending human nature where okay you're you're no longer constrained by what we were as humans or like human nature and now you can like transcend it because we've we've made like a cut well i guess we've yep okay hmm. yeah no and it, it 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 purposely brings about a cultural amnesia cultural amnesia yeah so in a, a willful uh loss of memory of who we are uh as as a as a people as our identity um you know what's a canadian identity you tell me uh, that's a great Prime question mr <laughs> says that there isn't one there is, right that, that's exactly what he said it is and but 50 years ago people would have said very different things and some of us who are a little older would disagree with him quite strongly but that he doesn't say that as a matter as an objective statement he says it as a wish fulfillment yeah. he doesn't want there to be a canadian identity because he wants to be post-national etc and and an inclusive canadian identity which is not going to be Canadian at all. It can be right. you know, anyone and everyone can be Canadian. Canadians, a Canadian is a Canadian, but a Canadian doesn't mean anything. In which case, of course, everyone's a Canadian, right? right. But, um, you know, it, it's it, it makes for good politics, I guess. I, I mean, I just sort of chuckle at it and say it's ridiculous, <laughs> but obviously it appeals to some people. Right. Um, anyway, um, I've got off track there. What? What to, where were we there? We're, so we were saying about the um, about the, uh, cultural amnesia. Oh, the cultural amnesia. Yes. So the thing about I mean, if you ever think about it, and you don't, most people don't think about it. What would it be like to be to have amnesia? I mean, you forget. Right. You forget everything. Everything. You forget who you are, among other things. Right. You could be a whole new person. Yeah, but you also have people around you. So a culture that has been taught or encouraged to be forgetful of itself has no, if you think about this for yourself. If you woke up the next morning with your, you've got your wife, you've got your workplace, you've got your family, you've got the, you're the city of Ottawa, you don't know where anything is. Right. You don't know who the person in the same house with you is. Is this a friend or is it an enemy? Well, she's speaking to me. She seems like she knows me, but I don't know who she is. Mm -hmm. And I, how am I to relate to her? And you think, okay, well, this is, this is okay, but I don't see that as this is the relationship with my wife. There's a there's a woman here, okay, but there's another woman that's just gone across me in the other street, and I find she's interesting as well. Mm. Why would you not be interested in that woman? Well, you may well be, but why would you have any stronger attachment to this woman who's in your house than that? You wouldn't. You what it would that. make you what it would make you, in other words, it would make you entirely unpredictable. Mm. Uh, to yourself, you wouldn't know how you were going to act, and not, nobody around you would know how you were going to act, and they would learn very quickly not to trust you. And so a culture that has been taught to be amnesiac, mm. and they taught, they've been taught this, uh, is unpredictable. They don't know what they're going to do because they have been brought to the position they have no more, um, they have no muscle memory, if you will, of how to act. And the, we and, and the West is generally... The West seems to have forgotten where it came from, right? That, like we, we've, we've, you, we no longer do the cr great tradition in schools. I mean, some, I guess some schools still do it, but generally, you, not many. Not many. Okay, so that's one. And I, I think there's a resurgence. There is a resurgence in classical, yeah. but it, it's, it's certainly not the majority. And, and this, this, this would be culture amnesia. It's enforced culture amnesia. Okay. Paradigm of John Dewey. John, John Dewey, the the sort of father of modern education, yeah, uh, progressive humanist, wanted to um, never mind teaching the knowledge of the past. Okay. Let's prepare people for the future. But there's no point in teaching them things that uh, have already been accomplished. Let's prepare people for future knowledge. That that's his paradigm. Uh, so, really. How how would one go about teaching people for the future? I don't know it, it, what it ends up getting. Uh, it ends up making them um, amenable to social indoctrination. Really, mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's about so look at the modern school system where nobody can fail. Right. 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 Like, I mean, I, the teacher. I mean, I don't know what the school boards say about that, but they're not allowed to fail kids. The only way the only way you can fail is if you don't come. So you just have to show up. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't fail. And of course, th there are things that are being taught there, 
And one of the things that is being taught is that it's important to be agreeable and to get along and to accept um, those in authority over you and just to do what you're told, but, and to get along and to be tolerant and inclusive and to make virtue signal that that's what you're being taught that. And you're also being taught though, that education has nothing to do with the dissemination of knowledge. (laughs) It has nothing to do with moral virtue. Right? you're not supposed to be courageous you're supposed to be active for the causes that you're right. being taught to be incensed about and you're being given an account of history which um, is at the very least questionable and i would say altogether false uh and and so the kids come out of it as i said earlier they they come out apathetic and confused and the they're, ready to, they're able to learn they're ready to learn human nature right. not generated on the cognitive level but they've just never been stimulated. And and being in within a, a, a liberal society, it seems to me that it, it makes it worse because within the liberal society, at least we're taught, you know, you could be freedom is doing whatever you want to do, right? Whatever you desire, that's freedom. You can do it, and that seems to be incomplete. That's a total, the total falsehood. Right, because freedom. Freedom to me, see, freedom to me is, in one sense, controlling one's emotions and will by the intellect, and so there's a sort of discipline. To be the freest is the one, is the man who is who controls his will and his emotion. But in our but of a highly unusual understanding of freedom in our day, though, right? Right, and and so within the univers- uh, within the education system you're not really taught this. So, I mean, like, you know, if you're taught inclusivity, tolerance, you know, whatever else, like the sex education, you know, in Ontario, which you are very well aware of, all these things seem that it it kind of perpetuates it more being in in a liberal society where you're like, okay, being free is doing whatever you want to do. I'm going to teach you these things. Go do them for the future. Well, I don't think we live in a free society anymore. Okay. No, it's just, it has the... Uh, just like a nominally like, live in a food free society? Well, I mean, we, we, we are, we're taking to task the, the Chinese right now for their the involvement in this Huawei, um, you know, the phone company and all yes. that. Because of its involvement with the government, it's the, that the, the company and the government are basically linked in a way that there's no, there's very little room between them. Really, one's an organ of the Communist Party in some way. Or furthering it, or at least that's mm. the charge being made and therefore we have a problem with this but we have the exact same thing uh right now with the scandal with this snc lavalin in, in montreal right the liberals and there's a lot of and this is the problem with big government parties is that they tend to work very strongly with big organizations and then it's very hard for civil liberties to function in that context mm-hmm. and 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 the government has grown in its size and it's uh, the burden of taxes have grown over generations. Yeah. I don't know percentage of uh, workers that work for the government at some level in Canada, but it's it's well over 30%. Yeah. And the tax burden that goes with that means mm-hmm. less economic freedom. And then with if you can't be, have any economic freedom, then you can't really uh, afford to be able to speak out either. Mm. So people are very careful about what they say. And effectively, then your other liberties get curtailed along with it. Interesting. And if you become morally degenerate as well, then you lose your moral integrity, in which case you're not willing to Speak stand up. Up either. And, right. and as you know, uh, moral corruption is a problem all over the place, increasingly. You're right, because Judge, um, what's her name? Minister Judy, right? That was the one who resigned over this SNC scandal? Just today. Just today, okay. Signed, she was she was uh, dismissed as the justice minister and, and he was uh, that that was uh, a few weeks back now but just today she resigned as the uh, uh, minister for uh, veterans okay after Tr- Mr. the Prime Minister Trudeau yesterday had said that the fact that she was still in the cabinet should say to the public that she was still with him Right. <laughs> so the day she resigned, like, I guess one could construe from that that maybe she isn't with you then. And so the, yeah, it's big scandal stuff, actually. It's um, it's it's interesting because like Prime Minister Trudeau started off, you know, as 
as the one who, who will save some ways. But now it's gone the other way. It's it's not looking good for him on that front for sure. Right. Um, I mean, obviously, there's uh, he's disputing what she's saying, and uh, we're not quite sure what she's saying at the moment because she's, she's uh, getting legal. Well. But uh, it, it, the optics, if you're talking the politics uh, speak of our day, mm -hmm. they don't. Uh, and uh, that that company SNC Lavalin, I mean, half of the the World Bank, mm -hmm. half of cases of corruption around the world are connected to Canada and all and and all but two of them are with this company SNC Will Avalon. So, oh. so they're a long standing wow uh, and their whole business is lobbying governments for business. Okay. Their whole business and they were facing criminal charges for it, which would have meant they were not allowed to lobby for business for ten years. Well mm. if that's your business and you can't do it for ten years, you've just gone out of business. Right. And if they're long time long standing supporters of the Liberal Party, which they are known to be, then obviously there's a, a political interest, not for the government, but for the Liberal Party to save their bacon. And mm. it looks like that this uh, uh, our former justice minister was not willing to do that and she got fired for it. That's what it looks like. So yeah, it's a it's a scandal of the first order. I mean, who said that Canadian politics was boring? <laughs> That's not very boring. You should do you should do um, political commentary as well on your YouTube channel. Oh yeah, well, you know, I just sit down and do, do. There's a lot of political commentators out there. I, I can do better stuff than that. I mean, yeah. it's not that that's not worth doing, but there are a lot of people who are really good political commentators. So I think I can add things that aren't being said, and that's better use of my time. But I'm happy to make a commentary. Yeah. Do you have um, any new projects coming up? Obviously, you have your YouTube channel that you're posting your lectures on do you have any other projects that you're working on like a book maybe yeah i'm, I'm working on a book on uh, c.s lewis and J.R. tolkien on the issue of uh, um their science fiction works and fantasy works on those themes of uh, that we've talked about before the transhumanism and yeah. the ism they're sort of i think prophetic and the things that they speak about um and um and it's funny again in both the case of both popular authors hugely appealing to a uh, constituency far broader than the christian one okay. and i not intriguing so again just like peterson again although these guys are um uh, writing from christian convictions i'm not sure that jordan peterson is right but similar resonance is what i'm talking about okay and is is this a um is this one book or is it like, are you writing multiple? Well, I'm working on a, I'm working on an essay or a, a publication right now for the gospel witness, which will be on the loss of the, uh, I'm calling it from person to person and the loss of the uh, image of God in contemporary okay. um, society. Um, but, uh, and I'm speaking at a conference out in Calgary in early March on okay. science fiction. And I'm going to talk about what's the title, the mythology of science, which will be. Where's that happening? Uh, Calgary. It's so it's oh, Calgary. mythology of science. Are both in Calgary, or is it There's, just? It's Calgary and Edmonton. It's a the conference is called Be Ready. Okay. I'm just one of the, um, you know, the undercard speakers. I'm not one <laughs> of the. <guys. laughs> I'm not the main event, but still, it should be interesting. Uh, it's a, an apologetics organization, but I think it's quite it's quite a good one. And uh, I've I've actually never been to Calgary, so that should be interesting. Okay. And I'm still working on classical education, trying to yes. bring that because I, I just think it's so vital that um, I not just be writing for academics or even the general public, but in some ways, reaching the next generation mm. in a way that's transformative. It's 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 the sort of work you don't get credit for immediately but it's the one that pays the dividends down the road is right. if people are put on the right path early on and they're taught to think and they're taught to be uh, appreciate good things and beautiful things and true things uh, i think it transforms their lives and it has a multiplying effect because they will influence and affect the people around them so it's it's a worthy endeavor but it's not one you get much um, credit for yeah because it, it'll, it'll take like, you know, maybe 15 years to see. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah. yeah.
right you know but but see this is the point if you if you have hope for the future um then you um you have a view of history and providence and and that means that you you revere the uh, or have a pious attitude towards those that have gone before you i, I mean i'm an educated fellow relatively speaking but i can tell you i can't hold a candle to the to the characters that i teach in my classes uh, and so i introduce people to a, a great conversation really of, of authors and teachers for throughout generations and people are being brought into that great conversation and their lives are changed by it and so that's a great thing to be able to do personally and and to teach others to value it so they'll can they'll pass on the torch as it were yeah for sure i think that i think that's super important especially seeing as education is going down the drain perhaps maybe it is down the drain yeah well i mean it's hard to know how far down the road is i mean as you say maybe there's a lot of profs that are saying that they're they support jordan peterson so maybe their classrooms are are not as bad as i feared they might be but they're not as good as they ought to be then if yeah. they're not stand up either so you can't really change uh the future if you're not willing to stand up in the present can you for sure yeah it's pathetic well scott thanks so much for doing this with me i don't know and I, I think we should do this again sometime there's so many other things that i wanted to ask you but yeah. we'll have to do another one all right no problem all right thanks not at all. Take care.